taxation, even though it's hard-coded in the United States Constitution by the 16th Amendment, it is still one of the most divisive subjects in America today. America's tax system is one of the worst in the industrialized world. Eliminate student debt, and we do that by placing a tax on Wall Street. Okay, wealth tax is the, one of the worst ideas ever created by the human mind. There, people are going to have to start paying their fair share in taxes. The wealthy should pay more. Uh, my God, I don't know how much more we can pay. All I'm asking for is a little slice for the tippy, tippy We, top. as Republicans, are not going to support tax increases. Uh, everything's uh, on the table except raising taxes. Uncle Sam, I want to know what you're doing with tax money. Oh, you've got incompetent use of funds. Like where you, does the money go? Exactly. All our taxes. Where this does it go? This idea that if you tax the rich, that all of a sudden all the problems will stop. The top one tenth of one percent now owns almost as much wealth as the bottom ninety percent. I don't want to pay tax. Before I came here, I was a private developer. I was a private business people. Like every other private person, unless they're stupid, they go through the laws, and that's what it is. To like the tippy tops. Uh, on your 10 millionth dollar, uh, sometimes you see tax rates as high as 60 or 70 percent. To raise our taxes more? They, why don't we figure out who the fuck is stealing all our money? Maybe it's not a revenue problem, it's a spending problem. We've got people who don't understand how to balance a budget who are running this country. That's a guarantee. Now, taxation itself is not the problem here, since you do need a way to pay for all of these public services that we as a group get to enjoy. But it doesn't mean that taxes are the holy grail to fixing all of our problems, although some politicians desperately want you to believe this. Is the goal of your plan to tax billionaires out of existence? When you have a half a million Americans sleeping out on the street today. Housing, health care, child care, the costs are out of sight. And millions struggling with the oppressive burden of student debt. These politicians pretend as if higher taxes equal no more poverty, no more crime, free healthcare, and cheap universities. So basically, peace and happiness for all. This is a big fat lie. You see, it doesn't matter how much taxes you collect, what truly matters is how you spend these, and more importantly, how you control your future spending. This is the biggest reason why higher taxes will fail in the US, and this is the biggest reason why high tax countries in Scandinavia and Europe seem to be doing so well. These countries all spend their money in a completely different way than the US does, and they are using massive amounts of legislation to keep their future costs down. In the US, politicians love to point to the Scandinavian countries when it comes to justifying higher taxes. We know that in countries in Scandinavia, like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they are very democratic countries. Obviously, the voter turnout is a lot higher than it is in the United States. In those countries, healthcare is a right of all people. In those countries, college education, graduate school is free. By referring to their amazing quality of life and having universal healthcare, which is not free, by the way, like some politicians make it out to be. You actually still have to pay a low but monthly premium, small out-of-pocket cost for medicine and certain procedures, and you and your employer are heavily taxed on your salary with contributions to the healthcare system. But this is all besides the point. Since the dirty secret here is that they are not great because of their high taxes, they are great because of how they control the money flow and the priorities they set in their yearly budget. Many experts told us that it was a bit naive to believe that a democratic society and a democratic system could manage such a big cash flow in a sustainable, responsible way. But the experience so far in Norway is that we have been able to do exactly that. Politicians in favor of high taxes are deliberately comparing apples to oranges in order to manipulate you. So let's take a closer look at what they're actually comparing. Here we see a breakdown of the big, evil and low tax United States on the left. And on the right, we have the well-behaved little boys of the Netherlands and Denmark. Do you notice any major differences here? If you said defense spending, you are correct. Because although many countries love to complain about America's big shiny army, force feeding their foreign policy to everybody, they sure do love relying on it to protect themselves. This ends up costing America well over $700 billion a year for operating and upgrading the US military, which doesn't even include all of the veteran benefits and healthcare costs that you need to provide to your former soldiers since having a big military creates a big veteran pool. Now this defense spending is almost 11% of the entire US budget, 
And when you compare that to my beloved cheese loving hippies in the Netherlands, we see that they only spend around 3.3%, which is around 11.3 billion. And the lovely Danes are more concerned with their smurbro than they are with fighting wars, which results in a defense spending of only 2.2% or 3.8 billion. So if you're going to model America after the Scandinavian or European model with universal healthcare, cheap universities and a much lower income inequality, then you must copy the entire recipe, which means cutting defense spending to only 3.3% of the yearly budget and this would give you an extra $483 billion. Life is a lot easier when someone else is picking up the bill to pay for your safety. So we have 52,000 soldiers in Germany. It's a tremendous amount of soldiers. It's a tremendous cost to the United States. And Germany, as you know, is very delinquent in their payments to NATO. And they're paying 1%, and they're supposed to be a 2%, and the 2% is very low. It should be much more than that. In addition to that, I was the one that brought it up. Everybody talks about Trump with Russia. Well, I brought this up a long time ago. Why is Germany paying Russia billions of dollars for energy, and then we're supposed to protect Germany from Russia? How does that work? It doesn't work. So clearly, the US military is a huge drain on the yearly budget, and this is something that high-tax nations don't have to deal with, which allows them to spend much more on education, healthcare, and social security. The Dutch, for instance, spend well over 31% of their yearly budget on social security, and this greatly reduces income inequality, while the US only spends around 16.7%. The Dutch also spend a massive 26.4% of the yearly budget on healthcare versus the 18 to 20% in the US. But I'll get back to this in a sec, because things are about to get way more complicated than this. Let's pretend for a second that the proponents of higher taxes get exactly what they want. We start taxing the rich, as they say, and we round up to get a nice even $500 billion a year. This is a massive number, and surely you can do a lot with that money, right? If they would pitch in two cents, it would produce enough revenue to provide universal childcare, universal pre-K, raise the wages of all of our childcare and pre-K workers, and technical two-year college and four-year college for all of our kids at public institutions and cancel student loan debt for about 95% of the kids who've got it. But well, this is absolutely false. This money will never do what they claim it will, or more specifically, a large part of it will never end up at the desired location. You see, when these politicians say, let's raise taxes so we can pay for this thing over here, what they fail to mention is that that's not how spending works in the United States Congress. As a matter of fact, in the current system, it is ridiculously difficult to precisely direct where the tax money is going and how it's going to be spent once it gets there. This is the second big difference between the Scandinavian and European countries and the US. You see, each year the president gives his budget proposal to Congress on how he would like to spend those sweet Benjis. And then Congress has to pass several appropriation bills to actually make the money available for spending. And this is where the first major hurdle pops up. Because if you look at this simple phrase right here, you'll see that funding for healthcare or education is nicely wrapped up in funding for labor, defense or energy. And we all know that every discussion gets a lot easier when you add more and more people, right? Now in addition to this, the second sentence makes it even more twisted since this spending bill also dictates how these funds are allowed to be spent by other bills. What this shows is that even if you manage to pass a new tax law, and raise corporate taxes, income taxes, or capital gains taxes, there's simply no way that money's actually going to do what you want it to do. So as you can probably tell by now, this creates all sorts of back-channel deal-making between different senators, representatives, and even the governors get involved. Holding this bill hostage is not going to work in getting my support for rec reconciliation bill. Throughout the last three months, I've been straightforward about my con concerns that I will not support a reconciliation package that expands social programs and irresponsibly adds to our $29 trillion in national debt that no one seems to really care about or even talk about. But it gets even worse, because even if you manage to pass the tax law and somehow get Congress to send 100% of the money to the specified departments and programs like education and healthcare, 
then the governors of those states can simply refuse to use that money that is allocated. Big story, Governor Mike Parson says Medicaid will officially not expand to thousands of Missourians this summer. And now to the terrible predicament facing hundreds of thousands of low-income Texas families. They make too much money to get Medicaid, but not enough to buy private insurance. The legislators did what they thought was right. Whether we agree with it or not, that's how this they're set up. This is how democracy is set up and they both chose not to fund it. Expansion was expected to cost $1.9 billion, with less than $130 million coming from the state. We can do this in a way that works for Texas, controlling costs and increasing access to health care. But Senator, you know that several bills were filed in the last legislative session following the lead of other states to let voters decide. Right. And that didn't even pass. How in the world do you think you're going to convince Republicans of this? People are probably going to have a hard time understanding that. It says, wait a minute, I voted for it and you have said that you would fund it, but all of a sudden now you're not going to fund it. It's a shame. Uh, it's disappointing that the governor uh, made this decision. Before we continue, please like and subscribe to support the channel. So like I said earlier, taxation is just one small step since spending is where the magic really happens. And when you create a spending bill with dozens of requirements, a lot of people might not like what's actually in the bill and they can easily block or refuse to use it. With this system in place, higher taxes simply means more money to the government, but it doesn't guarantee at all that the money will provide cheap education or universal healthcare. And speaking about healthcare, here we have another major difference between the European countries and the United States. Because the main problem with the United States when it comes to healthcare is not insufficient taxes, it's actually overpaying for the current healthcare system. They billed our insurance company over $3 million for the cost of transplant. Then I have another e, EOB right after it, which was another $1 million. So you're looking at a $4 million transplant. I don't know what people do without insurance. How, how could you even begin to pay that? 18.6% of the United States yearly budget goes to Medicare and Medicaid, which is around $1.2 trillion a year. Now some healthcare costs are also included in the non-defense spending and other spending, so the total percentage is closer to 20%. Now when we compare this to the Dutch and the Danes, who paid around 26.4% and 16.6% respectively, you see that the US is actually paying on par with that of high tax nations. So why then is there no cheap universal healthcare available to everyone in the United States? Well, simple, the United States basically pays $100 to get $25 worth of care while the Dutch and the Danes pay $100 and get $90 worth of care. This all happens because there are massive inefficiencies built into the US healthcare system, making it one of the most expensive in the world. The US is by far the number one spender in healthcare, so on a per capita basis, we are 30% more expensive than the next closest country. So we should have absolutely the best healthcare system, and yet, we don't. We have currently nearly 250 million prescriptions for opioids written every year. That's enough for every adult in America to have a bottle of pills and then some. Part of it is the way we pay for health care in the fee-for-service system. We pay for an office visit, we pay for a drug, and that encourages use, but it doesn't necessarily encourage better outcomes. Which makes it pretty much impossible to solve the current problems by raising taxes. Because when you're already spending more of your yearly budget on healthcare than the Danes do, then you clearly do not need to raise taxes. What you need to do is control spending. Right now, the cost of every single item in the American healthcare system is grossly overcharged, and it's all due to the huge administrative burden. Now, I'm not saying that the US healthcare system is terrible and that it only has drawbacks. It's still one of the best in the world that gives users the most flexibility and options. However, this only applies to the people that can afford it. Think of the US healthcare system as a transportation system. You can either operate it centrally, like public transport, with buses and bus stops at fixed locations, with fixed times, that can get you from A to B for just $5, or you can operate it individually with cabs that come to your house at a specific time and drop you off at your desired destination for $30. In both cases, you safely get from A to B. However, what you spend and the enjoyed flexibility varies wildly. This is a very simple trade-off that you have to decide on as a nation before you raise taxes because it will determine how effectively you can spend those taxes. 
Pretty much all countries with universal healthcare have a very strict federal policy of setting prices on medicine and medical procedures, and they regulate the buying of healthcare in bulk, just like when ordering machine parts. The government, healthcare providers, and insurance companies all work as one to create a single healthcare package for all citizens for the entire year, in which prices are fixed and people are guaranteed access no matter what the injury is or their financial situation. This means giving up some flexibility and freedoms, and in the United States, many people might not want to do that. But let me rephrase, in the United States, many people absolutely hate that, because it's exactly what the whole Affordable Care Act debate is about, also known as Obamacare. And unless you've been living on the rock for the past years, you know how angry people can get when it comes to Obamacare. I have to have coverage in order to make sure that I don't die. There are people who have cancer that have that coverage, that have to have that coverage to make sure that they don't die. And you want to take away this coverage and have nothing to replace it with. As a Christian, my whole uh, uh, philosophy in life is pull up the unfortunate. Yes. The funny thing is, Obamacare isn't even full universal health care. It has some elements of it, but it's not the full functioning Scandinavian or European system, and already people are losing their minds. You cannot put this, bill into action. this is why claiming that higher taxes will provide free healthcare is a giant lie, since you can't even get the policies in place to actually provide universal healthcare to the American public. The public support just isn't there, and without the correct system in place, there's no point in raising taxes. You're just going to be stuck holding a giant bag of money that's going to be spent on other things. This all shows that the majority of the problems are only solvable by changing the way you prioritize and allocate spending, which is much more complicated than just raising taxes on the rich. It involves fundamentally changing the way the government functions. Saying things like taxing the rich and pay your fair share sounds cool and you can easily sell this to a large group of people, but the reality is you need a system in place to actually give the people what you promised them. We already tried a 70% tax in 1970. Back then the median family income was around $10,000 and only 3.5% of American families made between twenty-five dollars and 50000 the greedy elite of those days were families that made over $50,000 a year, which was about 0.5% of the population. So above $50,000 a year, you would be taxed at a massive 56%, going all the way up to 70% at everything above $180,000. Now if life was so great back then, then why did they change it? Simple, it wasn't. Because in 1970, between 12 and 20% of the population was living below the poverty line, depending on who you included in the calculations. Since back then, there were some serious, um, let's say unresolved issues related to skin tone. So yeah, blatant racism aside, this poverty line obviously meant no college, no access to healthcare, and usually terrible living conditions. Basically the very same problems we see today, and now they want to go back to the old system by taxing you 70%. This is absolute madness, and shows that they are simply ignoring the real problem. If you let costs run out of control, you are always raising taxes and inventing new taxes to cover those increased costs. What you need to do is first plug the hole, and that means changing the system that governs education, housing, and healthcare so that these stop skyrocketing each year. But this not only requires massive policy changes, it also requires full bipartisan cooperation, and it requires a massive shift in how the society thinks. If a large group of Americans do not want to pay for someone else's healthcare or for someone else's education, then raising taxes will never work. And if Americans do not want to sacrifice flexibility and freedom of choice for lower costs and access for every citizen, then again, higher taxes will never work. Without the mindset and policy changes, higher taxes is just window dressing. This was why higher taxes will never work. Please like and subscribe for more videos.